Welcome to Sunday morning worship from Crofton Baptist Church. My name is Adrian Judd. I'm the minister here at Crofton. And whether you're joining us for the first time or you've joined us during this period of lockdown or you're a regular member of our church family, I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning service. If you've been with us over recent Sunday mornings, you'll know that we've begun a new teaching series entitled A Life Worth Living which is based on what we would, might be able to describe as a letter from lockdown, uh, written by the Apostle Paul as he writes this incredibly encouraging letter to the followers of Jesus from his prison cell at Rome. And our theme for this morning is living towards maturity. And a little later in our service, Wally Adeloy, one of our elders, is going to be teaching us from God's word. Also in our service today, we're going to focus on praying for children and parents and teachers now that the school holidays have begun such as they are. But we begin our service with a psalm which I know is a real favourite for many of you. It's a psalm which begins with a really important question. Where does my help come from? It may well be that help is something that you really feel that you need right now. Help in terms of uh, returning to work as lockdown uh, continues to lift. Help because you're feeling a bit worn down, the school holidays have arrived and you're weary and worn out from homeschooling and, and juggling working at home. Help because the future seems quite uncertain right now. Help because you have difficult decisions that you need to make. Or perhaps you're really struggling today and you are in need of help to make it through. Our psalm for this morning begins with these words, My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we come to worship a great God. And as we do so, we're going to reflect on the words of Psalm 121 and then into a great song of worship this morning. <laughs>
you are my shield. You are my strength. You are my portion. You're my deliverer. You're my shelter. You are my strong tower. My help comes of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray together. Almighty and all loving God, in awe and reverence, we come to worship you, to proclaim your greatness, to acknowledge your power, to recognize your sovereignty, to declare your goodness. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Compassionate and gracious God, with grateful hearts we come to praise you for your love that constantly surrounds us, for all the blessings of our lives, for the wonder of our world, for the hope of our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Living and life-giving God, in faith and trust, we come to petition you to pray for ourselves and for one another and for our world, to bring the concerns of daily life before you, to lift our loved ones into your presence, to commit the affairs of our world into your hands. Lord of all, hear our prayers. Lord of all, we offer you this time of worship, our praise, our thanksgiving, our confession, our petitions. And we ask, Lord of all, hear our prayer. Respond to us, we pray. Touch our lives with your living presence. Fill our lives with your grace so that our hope, so that our love for you may grow and, and our faith deepened in these challenging and uncertain days. Lord of all, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We're going to pause now for a few moments to quietly reflect on our own relationship with God and to take time to confess our sin and to receive the forgiveness that God offers. And to do that, we're going to hear the words of a psalm and reflect on these important words from Psalm 32. And then in a few moments, I'll lead you in a prayer of confession with words that you'll find on the screen.
And so we pray together. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We've not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. come to our prayers of intercession this morning and then to our Bible reading, I want to introduce you to Caroline Riggs, who works as a staff member in an organisation called Spooniker, which we support as a church. And they work as an organisation with local primary schools, sharing the love of Jesus Christ. I caught up with her a little earlier in the week to ask her a few questions about what they've been up to in recent months. Well, it's great, Caroline, to have you with us um, this morning. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and coming to tell us a little bit about, about the work of Spinnaker, which I know as a church we've been supporting for, for a number of years. Um, yep. 
but I know there'll be some people watching this morning who, who won't necessarily know what Spinnick is all about. So can you just tell us, just give us a brief summary of, 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 what, of what you're involved in? Sure, so uh, Spinnaker is a Christian charity which provides people to go into primary schools in the local area and uh, to give assemblies and sometimes RE lessons and RE experiences as well. Um, our mission is to inspire this generation of primary school children to engage with the Christian faith and explore its beliefs and values. Great, great vision. But I'm guessing over these last few months, that's been, uh, uh, that's taken things to a whole new level. Can you give us yeah. a, sense, a sense of what you've been doing over the last few months? Because obviously not being able to go into schools, I guess, in the, in the, in the way no. that you have in the past. No, so really, probably from beginning middle of March, we were unable to go into schools because although they were open they stopped having visitors in um we still had uh, an assembly on easter which is such an important one for us to do so i decided i was going to video myself doing our assembly and i sent that to the schools that i visit myself in orpington mm -hmm. and then as a team we sort of came together and thought actually this is probably the way to go forward we can't go into the schools to see the children and and with the schools closed after easter then mm -hmm. most of the children were at home but we really felt that we wanted to support the schools but we also wanted to provide some spiritual aspect for the children as well so we had already written an assembly pack for the summer term all about amazing places so between us as a team, we recorded each of those videos, uh, video assemblies, and each one included some facts about that topic, uh, a Bible story that was relevant to it, the theme, and a reflection and a prayer. So that was kind of our, our main thing. We produced six of those over the term. But also we wanted to do something to support the well-being of the children. Mm. So also we produced our Wellbeing Wednesday on social media, which was around a Bible verse and had a link to an appropriate website. And then also some sort of reflection that the children can do in school as the key worker bubbles, or they could do at home with their families. And they were called Thoughts for Thursdays. I've got a, this was one of our first, first ones, Thoughts on a Daisy. Yeah. And they were brief reflections and activities based on something um, natural or an object that children would find at home with a Bible verse as well that they could think about, but then other thoughts and uh, a prayer and activities as well. And not only that, and. but we also, um, again, on social media, we had a prayer for the schools and the teachers and the children each week as well to yeah. that our Spinnaker supporters could yeah. Um, yeah. help with as well. So you've had to be quite creative through this period. Have you had any sort of sense of feedback from how that's gone? Yeah, we've had a, a lot of support, actually, um, very encouraging. A lot of people that may not have known about Spinnaker, what we did, then had access to, mm -hmm. to the various yeah. things through social media. We're sharing a lot of things on Facebook, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I think the schools really appreciated having something that they could to send to the children or, or use in school with them. Brilliant. So yeah, it was it was really lovely to to see and how widespread these things has gone as well. Yeah, so it was really so good. It's, it's quite amazing to see how God's actually used this period, even to make people more aware of what you've been doing in the first place. Really, isn't it? So, yes, what's, what's, what's 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 sorry? Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just thinking, we found out our team was very creative, <laughs> <It was> very <laughs> able. Suddenly, we had to upskill yeah, ourselves in yeah. all various different things. So yeah. it was really good for that as well. I think you probably joined the vertical curve that some of us have been on over recent months, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> tell me about um, tell the sort of plans for September then. What do, what do you think that's going to look like briefly? 
Well, I think although the schools are open, whole school assemblies are out and outside visitors as well. So, but schools will still need to provide assembly. So it will be more in the format of class assemblies. Mm -hmm. So again, we decided we would still continue working on our assembly packs that we write. So we have a new um, pack produced on amazing bodies this time. And we decided that we will again video each of these different assemblies using different members of our team. So children in different schools will spot their spinnaker worker at some point and they'll be able to be played in the class um, with just straight yeah. away. So the class teacher won't need to do anything. And then in support of that as well, we've decided to continue with the thoughts on Thursdays and relate that to the assembly. So we've had, we'll, we'll have assemblies on the body, the skin, the brain, um, the mouth, various different parts of the body. And um, we'll have a reflection link to that as well. So either the, the teachers can use them as circle time, at, um, a time to discuss a uh, um, and reflect upon issues or they can use that as an assembly themselves because it will still cover the similar format yeah. to our video assemblies. Yeah. Really good, that's really good. In our service this week we're going to be praying for parents and for teachers and um, I just wonder how we can pray for the work of Spinnaker this week. What, what would be the, the top sort of two or three things we could pray for you um, as you prepare for the autumn? Well, God's guidance, really, that, and his inspiration, that we're doing the right thing. Um, we're creating resources that are going to be used. Um, I think it's, it's really important. We have, there's a lot of focus on the children's well-being, but I think they, they need the spiritual aspect mm. as well. So to pray that the schools will use these resources, because I think they're really important for the children. Um, and pray that the schools will be able, will be safe, that they will be able to continue in this, this new normal, I guess, and that hopefully at some point in the near future we can return to the schools and we can mm -hmm. go and mm -hmm. see them because we're, we're really missing off yeah. the children that we go and see. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, look, it's really lovely to catch up with you this morning. Thank you for giving us a snapshot of what's been going on. You're welcome. Um, Thank you for all your support as well. It, it does mean an awful lot to us. Well, I'm glad we've been able to touch base and we'll pick up some of those prayer pointers um, in, our, in our service this morning. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Caroline. You're welcome. Thank you. And so we come to pray together for the work of Spinnaker and focusing also on children and parents and teachers. Let's do that together. Father, we thank you so much for the work of Spinnaker and the creative ways in which they've been able to bring something of the love of Jesus Christ into our local primary schools. Thank you that even through these last difficult and challenging months, you have helped them to come up with new ways of communicating your love. Thank you for the encouraging responses they have received from both teachers and children. And as we pray for the work of Spinnaker going into the autumn, we ask for wisdom, as we do for all of the school principals and teachers in our local community. We pray that these summer weeks would bring much needed rest and refreshment. We ask this for weary parents who've been juggling the demands of homeschooling with working from home, for teachers and teaching assistants, and for those who kept schools open, for those who most needed it, and for children, many of whom who have found it so difficult to enjoy normal face-to-face -face friendships over many months. We pray especially for those children who have become vulnerable through these difficult months and we ask and we pray for your protection. We pray into the uncertainty of what lies ahead as plans are made to return to school at the end of August. We pray for head teachers and their teams as classrooms are prepared and as new ways of doing school are put together. And we pray for your protection over our children and over our young people, for those who've fallen behind in their education, for those who've missed out on key examinations, and for those who wonder what the future will hold. Have mercy, we pray. 
Thank you too for those who've worked so hard to prepare our online Zoom sessions with young people here in this particular local church week by week. May they know just how much we appreciate them and all that they do. Please continue to protect and watch over the many children and young people who make up such an important part of our church family here. And finally, we pray for ourselves as in a few moments we come to your word again this morning. We thank you for Wally and for Carol and for all that they mean to us here at Crofton Baptist Church. Thank you for the love that they show to each one of us and for the gifts that you have given to each of them. May we hear you speaking into our lives as we dig into your word together in a few minutes. And we bring you our prayers in and through the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're reading from Philippians 2, verses 12 to 30. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out of your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in warped or crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the words of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your, mes your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill and he almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Scorned by the ones he came to save 
Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. I body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip. in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the Good morning and many thanks again for joining us. My name is Wale Adiloye and I'm one of the leaders at Crofton Baptist Church Orpington. This is the fourth sermon in a study of Paul's letter to the Philippians. My sermon is titled, Living Towards Maturity, Built on the Rock. Built on the Rock is the school motto of my alma mater, Government College Ibadan in Nigeria, at which I was taught as a boarding pupil. Derek Bullock, an Englishman in his early 40s, was head teacher for my first couple of years. When I got to school, he had been there about 10 years. Despite a good disciplinary regime, we the boys loved our principal, who was fondly called Oga, meaning master or boss. Note that all teachers were called maths master, history master, or whatever. He dedicated his life to education in Nigeria and married Christine Groves, the Church of England missionary principal of nearby St. Anne's School, when they were nearly 50. They had no biological children of their own and they both lived and worked in Nigeria till their mid-70s. When the alumni of both schools, their children, quote and unquote, decided that they should spend half their days in the UK while living primarily in a granny annex at the home of one of the old boys to ensure that they had the quality 
of life and support befitting of our parents. With Christine, Oga would attend our London school reunion meetings when they were around and we would have a great time of feasting, fun and laughter. When they went to be with the Lord, both were cremated and their remains taken back to Nigeria and, as it was their dying wish, buried in Ibadan to lie where they met each other and the young men and women they were so fond of who adopted them as Papa and Mama. Well after Derek left the school, there were changes of government and many of the school facilities were in progressive dilapidation. About two years before he died, with about 30 of us in attendance, Derek spoke uh, to us about his recent visit to the school and the state of dilapidation. It was a bit like Nehemiah being briefed on the ruins of Jerusalem. Papa Derek challenged us to use our resources and lobby government to modernize the facilities and raise standards again. These were the passing instructions, last words of a passionate man, a father and mentor who was at the time frail and elderly. Needless to say that many years after, his words still reverberate and the old boys continue to help fund running costs and support the school with new and refurbished buildings. That story carries something of the setting of our passage this morning. Letter from a passionate and beloved mentor who had labored hard and had taken risks to life and limb for the gospel and for the church at Philippi. Paul is in prison awaiting trial. If found guilty, his punishment could be the ultimate penalty execution. His offense trumped up charges around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please pause for a moment to remember that today this is the reality of very many Christians around the world, incarcerated, tortured, their homes and property burnt down, they and their children killed. This was the future that Paul anticipated when he decided to write this letter, encouraging joy, preaching joy to Christians at Philippi. Indeed, he writes to you and I in Orpington, or wherever you are listening to me today. In the text before us today, Philippians 2, 18 to 30, Paul teaches on how faith in Christ should lead to a sanctified and triumphant life in him and glory in death. How can the good news of Christ lead to the bold and joyful life we see in Apostle Paul, who writes, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul is writing to relatively new Christians, not unbelievers. It's a young church in a difficult situation. They are facing frightening opposition. See Philippians 1 verses 27 to 30. The words like, whatever happens, uncertainty about how things will end up. Stand firm in one spirit, strive together without being frightened. For God has granted for you to suffer for him, for you are going through the same struggle I had and still have. It shows you where they are. So for faces of certain fate in prison, he says, I may live to serve Christ more, or may soon be executed to be with the ultimate lover of my life. The church at Philippi also faces opposition and trouble, and they have a varied quality of leaders and teachers. See 1, 16 to 17. Some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerity. This is akin to Paul writing to the Church of Christ today. Here, in coping with COVID-19, we seek God's face for a safe strategy to reoccupy our church buildings. Around the world, while persecution persists in some areas, the pulpit of Christ has become a path to worldly riches and political influence in others. Many new believers are being sold a lie not the true and full gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Paul is the father, the mentor who may not be available to guide them through these storms. So in these verses, he teaches them and us core principles, and he does it with examples. So what does this say in the passage before us today? In NIV, he starts with therefore. Whenever anything starts with therefore, it means you cannot start reading here. You need to go back to the there before. In fact, reading chapter 2, there's a cascade of therefores, starting from verse 1, then in verse 9, before our text in verse 12. To unravel the therefore and establish the context properly, we need to go back behind the first therefore to the last paragraph of chapter 1. Whatever happens, you are about to go through or are going through a difficult and uncertain, that is, faith trying time. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Our first therefore then goes on to define in broad principles what this manner worthy of the gospel of Christ is all about. It describes the mindset of Christ as the mindset of love and care, which drives divine deity and power to quell death in the hands of mere humans as an act of divine obedience and love. Our Lord Jesus Christ answered the same call that was foreshadowed by prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. In doing so, he voluntarily left his throne as God, as Adrian put it last week, to become like us so that we can become like him. The second therefore, in verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place, after the words obedient to death in verse 8. Many people reading this verse today are troubled by the word obey. So troubling is the word in its apparent connotation of mindless conformity that it is becoming unpopular in marital vows. But we misunderstand the word because we do not link it to the context of verse 8 of this chapter. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is obedience that is an act of conscious will to do what will delight the Father out of love for those he loves and, and sent his son to die for. Obedience in Philippians 2 talks of sacrificial love. This defines the context for the word today in our third, therefore. And the text today, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, he commends them that they have always shown this attitude of humility and sacrificial love and are not hypocritical about it. I wish we could truly say that, I wish we could truly say that about the Church of Christ today. We do some things one way when we are in the fellowship of Christians or Christian leaders and do things a different way in our lives outside the church. Each one of us is work in progress. And the Lord graciously points out our multiple standards as we allow ourselves to grow and be conformed to his spirit. The next set of words, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They also create a difficulty for very many people. Is our salvation to be by works or by grace? Why does Paul ask us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? J.B. Phillips' translation helpfully puts 12 and 13 this way. So then, my dearest friends, as you have always followed my advice, and that not only when I was present to give it, so now that I am far away, be keener than ever to work out the salvation that God has given you with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. For it is God who is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. 
in my opinion, this states what Paul is communicating better than NIV does. Work out in this context means be very aware of the Spirit of God working within you. Because God is powerful, all-seeing and all-knowing, carry that spirit with a sense of awe and responsibility, knowing that he gives you the will to do the right thing and the resources to attain the purpose he has set for your lives individually and corporately. Yet it would be wrong to make this passage too cuddly by completely removing the fear of God from the path of growing into Christian maturity. By bringing obedience, that is humility and sacrificial love, and fear into one sentence, Paul introduces a concept of two forces that every mature Christian understands very well. The love of God on the one hand and the fear of God on the other. Every child of God works in a healthy balance of both forces. While the love of God moves you to do acts of love, show mercy and respond empathetically to human weakness, the fear of God stops you from sinning or doing things that might bring shame to God's name. Paul's suffering and his eventual martyrdom was a working out of the love of God that moved him to serve even with his last breath. It was the love of God that moved Derek Bullock and Christian groups to spend 50 years in Nigeria to open up the world to folk like me. Had King David in the Old Testament been mindful of the fear of God, he would have stayed well away from Beersheba. Neither would he have tried to cover his shameful, lustful behavior with callous murder. The love of God moves us in Christian social action. The fear of God stops us from sin by giving us the motivation to resist temptation and choose holy living. In the words of an old song, God is watching us. While attending the Parents' Day at Eltham College a few years ago, the school principal told us about an 11-year-old pupil who, having read the school rules, asked him, is there a difference between the principal and God? To this he replied, there are some differences, but to you, my boy, this will be relevant over the next five years. Paul points in different parts of our text today that there are three component parts to the working out of our salvation. First is justification. That happened when we started the Christian journey by accepting the sacrifice by which Jesus Christ carried our burden of sin. The second is sanctification, the current process by which we are being made holy, even after the sacrifice of Christ has made us perfect in the eyes of God. That's from the book of Hebrews 10, 14. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The third part is glorification, a transition from what Paul, Paul calls a warped and crooked generation to citizenship of the new earth as the beloved bride of Christ, put in a different way by Steve Lawson. Justification, when we became believers, we were immediately saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, the maturing process within the challenge of daily Christian living as we are saved progressively from the power and practice of sin. At glorification, we transition to the new earth where there is no sin. We are saved ultimately from the presence of sin. Paul is writing to teach the Philippians how they may grow in maturity in the Lord while he himself awaits glorification if the Lord so wills. Going further in verse 14, he asserts that the working out of your salvation will require you to do things. We are saved to serve. We are to be disciple-making disciples. So a Christian cannot be without works of service. The love of God, which we experience, moves us to undertake acts of service, acts that fulfill his good purpose. 
we mature as we walk. A child learns to walk by trying to walk. Who would like their Christian life to be like a child who crawled all through their life because they would not risk a fall by standing up to walk? Note who is, drive, who is the driving engine in our maturing process. Verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Or as J.B. Phillips put it, For it is God who is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his, his purpose. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. In Paul's day, as, a, as it should be today, baptism immediately followed confession of faith in Jesus Christ. At baptism, the Holy Spirit falls on the believing Christian, just as he fell on Christ as he was baptized in the River Jordan. The Christian who is unbaptized or unaware of the gifts that they received at baptism lives denied of the resources to help them find the will and the full measure of power to achieve God's good purpose in their lives. Paul urges that positive and thankful living, the opposite of grumbling and arguing, that it helps to develop the blameless, sincere, and wholesome nature of God. This does not imply that we must all think the same way, agreeing at all times with the leader but to make our dissenting point in love and humility, being aware that the Holy Spirit flourishes where he says in verse 2, Christians live together in harmony, live together in love as though you had only one mind and one spirit between you. Evidence of Christian maturity can be seen in the contrast between the conduct which, pure, which is pure emotive and beyond reproach, and a worldly, warped and crooked generation in which people tear each other down rather than build up. Dissenting, dissenting positive contribution presents an opinion in a sensitive and spirit-filled contribution, while grumbling and arguing may be continuous well past the point at which it is edifying, well past the point at which the difference in opinion can coexist with the outworking of the Holy Spirit in the fellowship. The problem is that Christ very soon disappears from the center of the issue and the ego takes his place as the Holy Spirit very quietly exits the scene. Here is the contrast as we descend unchecked along that line. The ego leads to a warped and crooked generation of the world as against an illuminating light in the lane, shining, joyful generation of the word. Paul does not stop the teaching here. He gives two examples of maturity to emulate. Young Timothy, who he refers to as his son in the Lord, and older Epaphroditus, who is referred to as brother and colleague. This indicates that maturity is neither about age nor experience, but the mature attributes which Paul espouses and can be summarized in his commendation of these two disciples. He writes a reference to it for each of them in verses 19 to 30. And I will refer to the common threads of his reference. One, Christ-centered obedience. Timothy looks for Christ's interest. Epaphroditus nearly died for the work of Christ. Verses 21 and 30. Love for the people and the Church of Christ, Timothy showed genuine concern for the fellows. Says of Epaphroditus, he longs for you all. Thirdly, said, proved themselves in an exemplary life and humility and submission. Timothy submitted himself to humble tutelage, Epaphroditus, fellow soldier and messenger. Then fourthly, service, Timothy served with Paul Epaphroditus, a co-worker. All of these examples of faith worked out in the qualities of obedience. Christ obeyed to death, even death on the cross. By contrast, two other believers, Yodia and Sintich, are also mentioned by name in chapter 4, verse 2. 
Paul stresses their service and confirms their salvation. He says that their names are in the book of life, but they disagree with each other. The disagreement does not threaten their salvation, but Paul pleads directly with them and asks others to help them to be of the same mind. Note that he says and recommends that Timothy and Epaphroditus should be welcomed with great joy and honored, but not so about the disagreeable pair. We sit at the feet of Paul, who, like Oga Papa Derek, a few years ago, speaks with passion. He says, look to the rock, build on the rock. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock, the solid rock. Let the Holy Spirit free you from the power and practice of sin. But some people do not understand the mystery of Christ's obedience to death, even death on a cross. They have not met the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today is the day you can be made perfect forever and your name can be written in the book of life. Ask Jesus to be your friend today if you have never done so and get baptized in the Bible believing church. Ollie, thank you so much for teaching us so helpfully and so practically from God's word this morning. We have much to reflect on as we go into a new week. If you're watching this morning on Sunday, the 2nd of August, do join us for online coffee at 11.30 as we have a chance to chat and to catch up with each other. There'll be no Sunday evening Zoom prayer meetings going through the month of August, so watch out for details for the next uh, prayer meeting. And if you've not had a chance to fill in the questionnaire which we have circulated through the last week, and I please encourage you to do so. It's wonderful to see so many responses coming in from so many people, but we want to hear from as many people as we possibly can. And so as we come to our last song, a prayer as we go out into a new week is a prayer of blessing, which we often say to each other and over each other. Do join with me this morning as we pray these words again. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. wrestling and in my doubts in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go Questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. to show True.